Okay. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the third, we are on the third, aren't we? To the third series uh, of this uh, set of talks. Uh, so just a reminder of the program there. So today we're going to be addressing the extent to which the Buddha might be viewed as a social reformer. And this view of the Buddha was commonly found in early scholarship on Buddhism, and it remains an important idea about the Buddha because of the number of prominent Buddhist teachers and activists in the modern world who are uh, really advancing this view of Buddhist practice as inherently engaged with social and political issues. Um, so issues such as social injustice or the climate crisis. And this view, which tends to be called engaged Buddhism in scholarly literature, takes many forms across different Buddhist traditions. And it's potentially in tension with uh, a different vision of Buddhist teachings as involving solitary study and meditation practice. So one of the most important things that the Buddha is said to have done is to found a monastic community. And this is usually referred to by the Sanskrit and Pali term Sangha. And I expect you've come across this if you've been teaching Buddhism before. Uh, this is listed as one of the three jewels that Buddhists take refuge in uh, alongside the Buddha and his teaching. And in the earliest days of Buddhism, to follow the Buddha's teachings properly meant becoming a monk or a nun. And this in turn meant obeying rules of celibacy, giving up one's uh, belongings and family and social responsibilities. And this probably never really involved complete withdrawal. Uh, if you think about it, the virtues of generosity, compassion and kindness necessarily involved others and monasteries were reliant on the support of lay people who provided food and other necessary uh, so uh, monks and nuns were also teachers, they performed rituals for lay people, and they often maintained ties to their families in some sense as well. And while not all branches of Buddhism today have that monastic tradition at their heart, the basic relationship between monks and lay people remains important, particularly in Theravada traditions of Buddhism, such as in this image of a largely Theravada monastery in the USA, which shows uh, monastics going out on their arms round, so collecting food from lay supporters they're carrying bowls there as they go out. So monastic renunciation taught by the Buddha probably wasn't total, but nonetheless, we get the sense that the path to Nirvana was viewed as a personal one, perhaps. The fact that our experiences are all characterized by suffering or are unsatisfactory, the key problem that the Buddha set out to solve, as we discussed last time, was tackled through personal practice. After all, if the cause of suffering is identified in the Four Noble Truths as craving, and bad karmic consequences are understood to be linked to deeds that are motivated by greed, hatred and delusion. And these are all personal mental states. And so personal mental training was the obvious solution. So this raises a question as to how continued engagement in the world would make sense within that framework. And yet many advocates of engaged Buddhist movements throughout history have seen these as being in harmony with the Buddha's original teachings. So in this session, we're just going to ask, to what extent was the Buddha socially engaged? What has he believed to have taught about the dangers and benefits of staying engaged with worldly concerns? Did he seek to change society or did he just teach people to leave society? And a reminder once again, as, as we particularly noted in the first of these sessions, that when we're talking about the Buddha, we're really talking about the character of the Buddha as recorded in textual and literary sources. But with that in mind, what does the early literature tell us about the Buddha's own engagement with social issues? So I've already mentioned that a key piece of the evidence here is the focus of the Buddha on the teaching of a personal path. And in, this is in the framework of monastic life. But there are a number of additional perspectives that we might consider. Firstly, there are many teachings about the importance of social harmony both within the monastic community and in the dealings of monks and nuns with people from outside of that community. So in several texts preserved by different Buddhist schools, and you can find a, a link to an example in the PowerPoint notes. So just a reminder that you can, after this session, download the PowerPoint file, uh, either from the Edinburgh Teaching Resources site or from the Cambridge site that we're circulating. Uh, and then in that PowerPoint file, uh, you can then reuse the images and any uh, quotations and so on. And in the notes section of the PowerPoint will be links to additional resources. So there's a, a full uh, example of this in the notes. Um, and, and what it is, is a little exchange between the Buddha and uh, his personal attendant, the monk Ananda, who is his cousin and a, um, a gentle character, very, very important to the, the Buddhist, early Buddhist community. <clears throat> 
Uh, Ananda says to the Buddha that he sometimes feels as though good friendship is half of the religious life. And the Buddha replies that Ananda is quite wrong. And here we might be expecting him to criticize Ananda for uh, his attachment as indeed uh, other parts of Buddhist tradition do. Uh, but no, the Buddha declares that good friendship is the whole of the religious life. Now, of course, this isn't ordinary friendship. This is about having a friend who is a Kalyana Mitra, is the Sanskrit um, term, it's often translated as spiritual friend. Uh, in other words, this is friendship with someone who is not only good in the sense of virtuous, but also good for you in the sense that uh, they help you along the Buddhist path. And the best spiritual friend was the Buddha himself. And in his absence, Buddhists find such friendship amongst mentors, teachers, and peers. But the basic relevance of the interactions, positive interactions with others is clear. This is not a solitary path. So on a very basic level, the need for others is recognized very clearly. Eradicating one's own greed, hatred, and delusion and craving can only happen in the context of interpersonal relationships. The support of other practitioners is important including in a monastic setting support from those who remain in society and then use their resources to make monastic life possible for others and although the an, an ideal form of the buddhist uh, path might be monastic the buddha also taught lay people how to live better lives as well and at the heart of this are the five precepts which you can see on the slide uh, and uh, we've put them in uh, a sort of simplified summary form, but uh, basically these five precept precepts, as I expect most of you know already, are to refrain from destroying living beings, to refrain from taking that which is not given, to refrain from sexual misconduct, to refrain from incorrect speech, and to refrain from intoxicating substances. Uh, and these basic principles are, of course, open to interpretation, and indeed the full text, um, which you can find in a link from the PowerPoint notes, is somewhat longer than this. But generally they provide a really helpful framework for living in the world that in a way that minimizes bad karma and maximizes, maximizes good karma. And the rules are perhaps not that radical, but they do show that the Buddha was not only interested in the practices of monks and nuns, he also sought to encourage better forms of living in the world. The five precepts might seem quite far from social reform, um, but let's just think about what happens when someone has a role in society that requires them to break the precepts. Did the Buddha seek to reform society by challenging such people to change their ways? Well, in lots of cases, the answer seems to be yes, but a little bit of a cautious yes, perhaps. So, for example, consider Vedic rituals involving animal sacrifice. We are led to believe from early Buddhist texts that such rituals were fairly common. And in the Vedic scheme, the priest who kills an animal in sacrifice is doing a good deed. As we noted in the last session, for Buddhist understandings of karma, killing is bad even in a ritual context. So the priest who kills the animal will experience bad karmic consequences as a result. And there's a, a famous story about this, which I've used for a previous session with teachers. Um, so I, I won't go into it in great detail now, but you can again find the full uh, text in the notes. And essentially the story involves a priest who is taking a goat to be sacrificed and then the, the goat starts laughing and then crying and the priest is a little bit freaked out by this and he says well why are you laughing and crying and the goat says well I laugh because this is the last of 500 lifetimes in which I have been born as a goat and killed in sacrifice and so finally I'm going to be freed from this uh, really unpleasant uh, karmic path uh, and then he cried because uh, he felt real great compassion for the priest because the priest is about to have 500 lifetimes as a goat as a result of carrying out the sacrifice. So uh, it's a fun story to teach with, uh, definitely worth uh, pulling out of the, the notes. Uh, it, it raises all sorts of interesting questions about karma, but the key point here really is that the Buddha taught that killing in sacrificial contexts is still bad. It still leads to bad karma. And in some ways, this was a form of, of social reform. It was a rejection of existing practices and a call to consider ethics in a different way. Even more so than priests, kings are considered to have a role that requires them to break precepts since they must impose punishments in order to keep social order. And they also have to defend their territories, so they must raise armies. And the Buddha is often depicted in dialogue with kings and evidence suggests that early Buddhism was quite successful in gaining the patronage of powerful kings and this is one of the reasons for its successful spread. So the third century BCE Emperor Ashoka is perhaps most famous in this regard. He's said to have been converted to a Buddhist worldview 
and then supported great monastic envoys, or perhaps we might even say missionary endeavours to the edges of his vast empire. He's also credited with building stupas, these uh, reliquaries that functioned as shrines and pilgrimage centres. So the image here uh, of the sandstone is um, carved into one of the earliest Buddhist pilgrimage sites that we have, dating perhaps the third or second centuries BCE, and it shows uh, Ashoka visiting the site of the Buddha's first sermon, which in itself became a, an important pilgrimage site. So the, the, the first, the, we know it's the site of the first sermon because of the wheel, which is symbolizing the, the setting in motion of the wheel of the Dharma, uh, but also because of the deer at the bottom who were said to be present at the first sermon. Um, the story of Ashoka tells us that he gave up violence. So this is quite crucial, but uh, he did so after having used violence to establish his empire and expand it. So it's a really interesting, uh, slightly amb ambiguous story. And, and we may well get a slightly sanitized version of the story as well because of his status as one of the most influential lay Buddhists in history. And stories of the Buddha's own encounters with kings are similarly ambivalent. He's shown offering advice to kings quite often, seeking to prevent conflict, but uh, while negotiating a place within society for his monastic institutions and his followers, he also seems to have accepted the need for kings and even potentially for armies. So there's a famous uh, passage from a text called the Mahavaga, in which a king requests that the Buddha stops ordaining members of the army. And the loss of soldiers to the monastery is presented as causing the king quite a few problems. And the Buddha, while clearly disapproving of violence, accepts the king's request. It's important to note that the Buddha elsewhere is shown declaring quite clearly that soldiers get bad karma because it is not possible for an ordinary human being to kill without a negative mental state. So the bad karmic consequences are inevitable. And again, all the links to the full resources, if you want to follow any of these up for your own teaching, are in the notes to the PowerPoint file. But the point here is that the ambiguity is there in the sources. And this ambiguity, or perhaps we might say more positively, flexibility or pragmatism, continues into modern times, for example, in the work of Buddhist army chaplains who can now be found across the world. And I sometimes find this a useful way into these discussions in my own teaching, uh, to the start, take the starting point of a, an army chaplain uh, from a Buddhist tradition and, and what their role is in relation to uh, soldiers and uh, potential, potential, uh, potential violence. So there's a key question here, isn't there, which is, does staying in the world necessarily involve compromising on Buddhist ideals? And the answers I would suggest are ambivalent. So where have we got to at uh, exploring the idea of the Buddha as a social reformer? So we've seen that a lot of Buddhist practices seem to require renunciation, and yet a harmonious and fair society, both within the community of practitioners and outside it, remains highly relevant to Buddhist ideals. The Buddha is shown disapproving of systems of ritual sacrifice, teaching kings how to keep the peace, but also accepting that kings and even armies might need to exist. So he doesn't seem to have sought to radically challenge or reform society, but neither did he wish people to simply abandon it. Right. Now, when people talk or write about the Buddha as a social reformer, there tends to be quite often a particular model of society that there is in mind, to which many believe he was possibly responding. And this model of society is something we could talk about a little bit more. This is particular to ancient Indian society, and it's already raised its head in at least one of our earlier sessions. At this point, it might make sense to take something of a detour to discuss this model. And so we're not now talking about Buddhism, it's relevant to what we're talking about today, but rather we're looking at a feature of Brahmanism, this being a foundation for what we today call Hinduism. So this next slide, and I want to make this very, very clear, discusses not Buddhism, but rather a cornerstone of Hindu thought, inherited from texts that we associate with ritualists in India, the priests uh, mentioned a few moments ago, called Brahmans or Brahmanas, or in English often Brahmins, um, with whom Buddhists debated in India for many, many centuries. So although this is relevant to what we're talking about today, the Buddha is a social reformer, you can also think of this as maybe a bit of bonus material if any of you uh, are also teaching topics in Hinduism or Hindu studies. Early Buddhist texts sometimes refer to Brahmins, that is priests or ritualists, and associated with sacrificial texts, the Vedas in particular, it talks about them advancing a particular model of society 
that understands them, that is Brahmins, to have a privileged position in it. So according to Brahminic sources, if one was born a Brahmin, they would argue one is naturally special at the top of a social hierarchy. Good also to be born as what would be classified in Sanskrit as a Kshatriya. Tricky things to translate these. This is sometimes translated as a noble, or maybe an aristocrat or a ruler. Whatever the case, Kshatriyas are people associated with wealth, with warfare, and with having and exercising power. And it would be good also, although not quite as good, to be born into a Vaishya family. And this means then anyone who was maybe a merchant or an agriculturalist, um, at any rate, someone born into a family with some means in some sense. And then still not the worst of all, but not great, would be to be born into a family that served others as a shudra, sometimes translated as a worker. Now, it wasn't simply the Brahminic position in ancient or classical India that people were born into different families associated with different vocations. Rather, the idea is that one necessarily had to behave in a particular way, fulfilling certain roles in society because of one's birth into one or other, uh, we could say, class. Now, for an example of this normative approach to a social order, we've got on screen here some verses from the Bhagavad Gita, a text that uh, I think was mentioned briefly in our first session. Now, this Hindu text certainly postdates early Buddhist literature. And in fact, there are some interesting uh, bits of evidence that this was at least in part a response to some aspects of Buddhist teaching produced by Brahmins. The Bhagavad Gita is, uh, or translates as the Song of the Lord, and it's very much uh, still celebrated today by millions of Hindus across India and indeed elsewhere. But those who hold this text to be authoritative have to deal with the fact that it exhibits this very rigid attitude to social mobility, or rather a lack of social mobility. So reading now some verses from the text, the duties of Brahmins, nobles, merchants, and workers, these being translations of these categories I just talked about, these are distributed according to qualities that come from their own nature. Tranquility, restraint, austerity, purity, Patience, honesty, knowledge, discernment, and conviction are the duties of Brahmins, born of their own nature. Valor, majesty, courage, skill, bravery, generosity, sovereignty are the duties of nobles, born of their own nature. Plowing, herding, and trade are the duties of merchants, born of their own nature, while service to others is the duty of workers, born of their own nature. So in every case here, people are said to be by their own nature required to fulfill this or that duty, this or that role in society. Note also, um, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, there are some people imagined to be even uh, below the lowest of these or outside of this fourfold classification, the so-called untouchables, and not even mentioned here. And their only role in life would be to fulfill the most menial or impure tasks. More on that in a second. Back now, though, to Buddhism, and indeed a relatively early Buddhist source that confronts this normative model of society. And that model of society, it's not necessarily describing things as they were over 2000 years ago, but rather how Brahminic voices decreed it should be, with them at the top and with others fulfilling uh, necessarily roles in society based on their nature. So this passage here is from the Buddhist uh, Asalayana Sutta of the Pali Canon. And in this, the Buddha is debating with a group of Brahmins about all of this. And these Brahmins are shocked that the Buddha holds that people of any class in society, from any of what are called the four Varnas, that's the Sanskrit term for these, these four classes we just talked about, the Buddha teaches that any of them could be pure, and not by virtue of their birth, but instead by, instead by virtue of their virtue, that is their moral character. And this is just an excerpt from a longer text in which the Buddha is uh, drawing his audience to concede that it surely can't be the case that there's real essential distinction between people based on their birth. So again, I'm simply reading what we've got on the slide here. Suppose, this is the Buddha speaking, first of all. Suppose a Brahmin were to abstain from killing living beings, from taking what is not given, from misconduct and sensual pleasure, from false speech, from malicious speech, from harsh speech, from gossip were to be uncovetous, to have a mind without ill will, and to uphold right view. And before I go further, you can see some overlap here with the precepts uh, just discussed a moment ago. Now, upon the dissolution of the body at death, would he alone go to a happy destination, even to a heavenly world, but not a noble, a merchant, or a worker who did the same? 
The audience responds, no, Master Gautama, that is the Buddha, whether it be a noble or a Brahmin or a merchant or a worker, those of all four classes of person who abstain from killing living beings and so on and so forth, at death would appear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. And so the Buddha leads them to this conclusion. Then by virtue of what or with support of what do Brahmins say Brahmins are the highest class of person, those of other classes are inferior. So Buddhist literature and the Buddha in this literature takes special aim not at the fact that people are born into different families, but the Brahminic notion that those born into Brahminic families are necessarily purer or better. And this is a common feature of Buddhist teaching as we know it to have developed uh, in India down the centuries. And very interestingly, this critique of a naturalized social hierarchy with people born into stations that determine very strictly their place in society is perhaps Buddhism's most enduring influence in India today. And this now with respect to the complex notion of the Indian caste system. And note before we continue that there's a subtle but important difference between this classical Brahminic notion of four varnas, these four broad classes just discussed, and the much, much more complicated idea of different castes or births, the term is jati, that relates to this, but is slightly different in India. So it's this notion of caste or birth that still troubles Indian society and politics today. The notion uh, that one's family, some claiming to be Brahminic, others fighting against stigmatization as untouchable, should dictate one's place uh, in society and also what one could achieve. Now here we come back to the figure of the Buddha himself as foremost a social reformer, because I think perhaps the majority of Indian Buddhists today think of him as just that. And this is due to the influence of a specific author, that is B.R. Ambedkar, the founder of what is today called Ambedkar Buddhism, or sometimes called Navayana Buddhism, Navayana meaning the new vehicle. Buddhism effectively died out in India, we think around about the 14th century, after it had been part of Indian, uh, the Indian cultural landscape for about 2000 years. As of the late 20th century, however, there are several million Buddhists back in India. Some of them are in the north and they include many uh, refugee communities from Tibet, but around 7 million Buddhists are in the heavily populated state of Maharashtra. And these are primarily Buddhists who follow this very uh, innovative and at least in India, influential interpretation of Buddhist Dharma that was introduced in the late 1950s by Ambedkar. Ambedkar was a hugely important figure in modern Indian history, a jurist, an economist, a political theorist, a social reformer, and indeed something like a quasi-religious leader. In the late 1940s, he was the primary author of the Indian constitution after India's independence. But he was also of Dalit heritage. That is, he was from one of the so-called untouchable castes in Indian society. And this meant that Ambedkar had triumphed in spite of some quite appalling social discrimination, denied equal treatment in his schooling and in his professional career. In his final years, in the mid-1950s, Ambedkar was outspoken that he associated social discrimination in India with Hinduism. And he saw Buddhism, a tradition all but lost to the subcontinent, was in fact the remedy to all of this. He very publicly converted to Buddhism, he wrote treatises on his understanding of it and of Buddhist Dharma. And through his example, he led to mass conversions of millions of Dalit or untouchable Indians to his form of Buddhism. And by re-identifying themselves as not uh, untouchable Hindus, but rather as Buddhists, these Indians made palpable their opposition to uh, discriminatory aspects of society that they took to be necessarily tied up with uh, Hinduism. Now, it's not our place today to discuss that phenomenon in any great depth, but it's worth looking at Ambedkar's idea of the character of the Buddha that is promoted in some of Ambedkar's late writings that are today accepted by several million uh, Indians as something approaching scripture. Uh, published post, uh, posthumously in 1957, for example, is Ambedkar's The Buddha and His Dhamma. This is a widely studied reimagining of the Buddha's life and teaching that Ambedkar proposed cut through received tradition to what must have been the historical realities of the Buddha's life and work. 
And significant is that the Buddha and his Dhamma has companion publications that Ambedka also wrote towards the end of his life that tell you a bit more about uh, the context of his thinking. He published The Buddha or Karl Marx and Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Ancient India. And this tells us something about the way Ambedkar understood the figure of the Buddha. Notice in all this, the influence of two things that we've discussed in the last two sessions. So first of all, Ambedkar proposes to know the historical Buddha who is there to be unearthed from mountains of Buddhist literature. And he makes bold statements about what this person must have thought, given the premise that the Buddha was in Ambedkar's mind, a certain kind of thinker and teacher. And secondly, this historical Buddha is undoubtedly something very much like a philosopher, as we were discussing last time. But for Ambedkar, the Buddha was foremost a political philosopher, who might also be best described here as a socialist, an enemy of class or caste distinctions, and also an avowed democrat, who here and there, according to Ambedkar, propounds the, uh, propounds the equality of men and women, irrespective of birth, and their right to a stake in political decision making. Ambedkar's Buddha is, I think we can safely say, a striking interpretation and a development of the Buddha uh, who we find in pre-modern literature. And it's today precisely this Buddha, the pacifist, revolutionary social democrat, who is read and studied by Ambedkar Buddhists across India and also in smaller numbers elsewhere. Ambedkar draws upon several cases in the Pali Canon in which the Buddha confronts the fact that his teachings might have been uh, misreported. And he then uses this to justify the position that in fact, some of the most significant hallmarks of Buddhist Dharma are surely erroneous and not what the Buddha said. For example, he writes that uh, the cases of misreporting are common with regard to karma and rebirth. And more on that in a moment. But how to decide what is or is not Buddhist teaching? Well, Ambedkar writes, if there's anything which could be said with confidence, it is this. He, that is the Buddha, was nothing if not rational, if not logical. Anything, therefore, which is ration, uh, rational and logical, other things being equal, must be taken to be the word of the Buddha. The second thing is that the Buddha never cared to enter into a discussion which was not profitable for man's welfare. Therefore, anything attributed to the Buddha, which did not relate to man's welfare, can't, uh, cannot be accepted to be the word of the Buddha. So Ambedkar's Buddha is a compassionate figure interested in welfare. And in a sense, this is what the Dharma conventionally understood is all about. But of course, that depends on quite what we mean by welfare and what we consider an absence of welfare to be as well. And Bedka's account of the Buddha's life reflects on what he takes the Buddha's message to have been. And it also interprets what little we have about the Buddha's first audiences. So this next striking passage is how Ambedkar describes the sentiment of the Buddha's first converts, those who witnessed some of the teachings we discussed in the last session. That is about the four truths, non-self, and so on. So the, this is now reporting what the Buddha's first audience must have felt. They felt that in him they had found a social reformer, full of the most earnest moral purpose and trained in all the intellectual culture of his time, who had the originality and the courage to put forth deliberately, and with a knowledge of opposing views, the doctrine of salvation to be found here in this life. In, Bed, in uh, Ambedkar's account of the Buddha's life, there are no heavens or hells taught. There's little mention of supernatural power or even the attainment of nirvana. And this because for Ambedkar, none of that was the point of the Buddha's teaching or of the Dharma. And at one point, he has these following words uh, put into the mouth of the Buddha. The purpose of the Tathagata, that is the Buddha, in coming into the world is to befriend those poor and helpless and unprotected to nourish those in bodily affliction, to help the impoverished, uh, the orphan and the aged, and to persuade others to do so. So the point of the Dharma, according to Ambedkar at least, is to oppose social inequality, which he considers to be coterminous in India with Hinduism. In the notes to this slide, which again you can uh, find and download, I go into a little bit more detail. Ambedkar's Buddha, for example, could not possibly have really taught about karma and rebirth, because these ideas are, for Ambedkar, Hindu ideas. They've been taught for centuries, I quote, to enable the state or society to escape responsibility for the condition of the poor and the lowly. The Buddha, as an opponent of Brahmanism, must have been an opponent uh, of teachings about karma. Although Ambedkar believes that all of that was likely lost a long time ago in the history of the development and transmission of the Dharma.
We mentioned already in earlier sessions that we can't claim that the India of the Buddhist time was home to anything like present day or 20th century Hinduism. But Ambedkar presents the situation otherwise. For him, it's very easy to draw parallels between India over 2000 years ago and the India of uh, his time of the 20th century. Also, let's remember that although early Buddhist texts confront Brahminic authority, as we've seen, and also confront these claims of Brahminic superiority and this model of four varnas, Buddhism also does certainly, and for the most part, deal with how to end the process of transmigration. And that's something that Ambedkar considers to be peripheral, as do many of his followers today. For Ambedkar, the Buddha foremost is the authoritative voice for the oppressed. He's the enemy of what Ambedkar perceived to be the great social ills of modern India. Today, Ambedkar Buddhists, most of whom are born into communities of so-called untouchables, or what are often now called the scheduled castes in India, they see the Buddha and Ambedkar as guides out of social, political, and religious stigmatization. Put crudely, by converting, they assert themselves to be Buddhists, something different to the majority Hindu society into which they're born. And interestingly, Ambedkar still holds the Buddha to be, in his words, explicitly a religious teacher. But for Ambedkar, true religion is not passive or mystical or otherworldly. Instead, it's a conviction to change the present world in profound ways. He writes elsewhere that the purpose of religion is thus to remove suffering. This is salvation, independent of God, the soul, and life after death. And let's remember here that the category religion is by no means one that means the same thing to any two authors or thinkers or communities in any two times, places, or contexts. For Ambedkar's Buddha, religion is working for an equal and fair society in the world. And although not always so focused on the Buddha himself, the idea that Buddhism requires engagement with social and political ills isn't exclusive to modern Indian Buddhism. And in fact, this can be found across a number of movements across Buddhist Asia and the rest of the world that have their origin in the mid to late 20th century. Okay, and uh, moving on to those movements then, which are usually referred to as engaged Buddhism. I just want to close today's session by looking briefly at how these fit into our exploration of the Buddha as social reformer. This does take us uh, very much to the edges of the theme for this series, but the topic is a really important one and can be very engaging, if you'll pardon, pardon the pun, to teach. So we wanted to include it. So the first thing to mention is that the relationship between engaged Buddhist movements and what are perceived to be the Buddha's own teachings can be framed in different ways. Some Buddhists seek to move away from what they perceive as early Buddhism's selfish or unhelpful preoccupation with inner struggles, but many also see the Buddhist teachings as actually encouraging engagement with social issues. And a little bit of reframing is all that it takes. For example, take the issue of suffering. So far in this series, with our focus on early Indian sources for Buddhist teachings, we have emphasized the teaching that suffering or unsatisfactoriness, uh, dukkha, is caused by mental states such as greed, hatred, delusion, and craving. And these mental states cause bad karma, which causes suffering in the form of bad karmic consequences, including some pretty um, impressive uh, tortures in, in hell realms, but also uh, much pain and suffering in other realms of rebirth too. And craving in particular keeps us bound in the cycle of rebirth, uh, a natural characteristic of which is that everything is ultimately unsatisfactory. However, it is undeniable that suffering also comes from, for example, social injustice, climate change, economic disparity, political corruption, and so on. One can cultivate non-attachment non to the idea of living in a country run by responsible human beings, but the reality of living in a country run by corrupt or incompetent people is still going to involve suffering. Whether that is poverty, lack of educational opportunities or crumbling national infrastructure, not at all talking about talking from experience at this point, of course. Attempting to reduce these causes of suffering in the external world can then be conceived as a core part of trying to help others in a spirit of generosity and compassion. And these, of course, are key Buddhist ethical ideals. Similarly, the early Buddhist teaching of the causally interlinked nature of our experience, which is a pretty complex notion, actually, that we won't go into here, is given uh, in engaged Buddhist movements often the name interdependence and it's used in modern movements to justify ecological activism in particular but also social activism as well. So you can see that some of these core teachings attributed to the Buddha are really foundational for engaged Buddhist movements 
So we may not have any early texts that show the Buddha teaching the importance of fighting social injustice or the need to look after the planet, indeed, which was presumably in a slightly better shape when he was around, but neither are such ideas contrary to Buddhist principles. So this might explain why engaged Buddhist movements have become so influential today. And as this quotation from Thich Nhat Hanh makes clear, for engaged Buddhists, it isn't about fighting injustice or meditation. For example, one links to the other. Meditation is seen as key to finding the clarity with which to engage with the world without being entangled within it. And I want to stay with the late Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh, who passed away earlier this year for my final point too. He's just a particularly prominent engaged Buddhist uh, teacher, although there have been many others. He's actually understood to have been the first person to coin the term engaged Buddhism uh, in the 1960s, when he also founded a new Buddhist ordination tradition called the Community of Interbeing. He very much presented Buddhism as being primarily about how one lives in the world. And one of his most influential teachings is referred to as the 14 precepts of engaged Buddhism. And these were the foundational rules that underpinned ordination into his Buddhist community. Uh, once again, a link to the full list can be found in the notes to the PowerPoint file, but I've presented a sample here as an illustration of how they expand key Buddhist teachings rather than counter them. So, for example, several of them can be seen as an expansion of the five precepts taught by the Buddha, which we encountered earlier. So, for example, precept 12, do not kill, do not let others kill, find whatever means possible to protect life and prevent war. It's an expansion of the first of the five precepts to refrain from killing. Similarly, precept 13 is an expansion of the rule against taking what is not given. Possess nothing that should belong to others, respect the property of others, but prevent others from profiting from human suffering or the suffering of other species on earth. And then precept nine expands the responsibility of truth telling to explicitly include the responsibility of challenging injustice. Do not say untruthful things for the sake of personal interest or to impress people. Do not utter words that cause division and hatred. Do not spread news that you do not know to be certain. Do not criticize or condemn things of which you are not sure. I should say all of these aspects so far are very much uh, included within some of the more expansive discussions of the, uh, the precept taught by the Buddha. But then we get always speak truthfully and constructively, have the courage to speak out about situations of injustice, even when doing so may threaten your own safety. Meanwhile, other precepts of engaged Buddhism address key responsibilities such as facing up to suffering, avoiding attachment to dogma, and choosing a vocation that doesn't cause harm. And precept 10, I think, is also very interesting for this session. Do not use the Buddhist community for personal gain or profit, or transform your community into a political party. A religious community, however, should take a clear stand against oppression and injustice, and should strive to change the situation without engaging in partisan conflicts. So this is a pretty clear call to Buddhists to challenge injustice in the world. And as Thich Nhat Hanh sees it, and in this he is in agreement with Ambedkar too, I would think, a religious community is naturally one that seeks to change society for the better. So whether or not the Buddha himself could be described as a social reformer, as we've seen, many modern Buddhists certainly see his teachings as paving the way to their own engagement in the world and its issues. While the early Buddhist monastic community took seriously the call to abandon worldly things to some level, connections with communities, local, regional, national, and now also international, and engagement with social, political, and environmental causes has always been some part of Buddhist practice. And in some cases, as we've seen, it has completely underpinned a group's uh, desire to identify as Buddhist. <laughs> 